What I want to do is to make a very practical um, presentation and look at the epigenetics of human longevity. That's our current research project at the UCSF School of Medicine. I'm going to back into some of the biochemistry and some of the assays we're using. I think the polyphenol study we just saw is a perfect example. It makes me very optimistic to make a rather bold prediction. The prediction is that within the next five to 10 years, we will have major breakthroughs that will ensure, ensure life expectancies of between 120 and 150 years old as a reality. I think that's very reasonable to expect that will occur and I'll hopefully we'll show you that as we progress. The, if I fast forward to the end of my talk, what I want to do is look at the common characteristics among the blue zone communities. In our research group, we've called them the divine dozen. There are 12 factors of living, breathing, in the world now communities where people live in excess of 100 years old on a regular basis, sustained, optimally healthy. We're talking about health span, not lifespan. Lifespan can be long, lingering periods of disability. Health span is living at a very high level until within two or three days, they die. But so that's the destination. Um, and now everything between now and then you can go to sleep. <laughs> You'll see I use a lot of cartoons because one, I enjoy them and two, because they really drive home points that people remember. I've had people come up a decade after giving a lecture and saying, oh, that talk you gave, and I'll start to say, really? And I say, yeah, that cartoon. <laughs> so the only thing they ever really remember is the, uh, the cartoon. So maybe out of this talk, you'll remember the, the cartoons. So epigenetics, you'll be hearing all about that. Epi means above, surrounding, encompassing. So it's everything, all the influences, internal, external, that influence the suppression and expression of the genetic predispositions that we have. This is everything we actually need to know about genetics, vertical, horizontal, and then the cross hatching. That's, that's it, that's, that's, that's genetics in a nutshell. <laughs> so this is also dedicated to Bessie Hedricks, who's the oldest person documented to be alive in the United States right now at age 116. Now that may seem extraordinary, but I think by the end of this presentation, you realize that is an expectation for all of us, literally here, listening, hearing this. Um, so my position on this um, prediction is that the picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen, I would add ladies. The world's climates are changing, the mammals are taking over, and we all have a brain about the size of a walnut. Now, in this area of practical human longevity, if you don't feel like that, I'm shocked. This is a bewildering area. It's like trying to pick a snowflake out of a blizzard, and you'll see examples of this as we get into it. DNA isn't your destiny. So Time, even Time Magazine, realizes that 20 years ago when we first mapped the complete human genome, which, by the way, was only completed a few months ago, there were enormous gaps in the uh, uh, genomic map until only about eight months ago when, quote, the dark genome began to be mapped out. So this is quite recent that we've really understood it. This is one of the first studies by Vert Vogelstein at Johns Hopkins that is just the, the absolute classic. Um, it's a longitudinal study in 2012 that compared thousands of identical twins, so genetically identical. He looked at 24 major diseases over 15 years and he found that when you looked at one twin and the presence of that disease in that twin, how accurately did that predict the disease in the other? He found that for Parkinson's, the risk was 5%. For coronary heart disease, it was 50% chance. And for most cancers, it was less than 50%. So the, uh, and also this can be misleading because the predisposition to a disease only predicts one disease. It does not exclude all of the others. So one twin might have heart disease, the identical twin might develop Parkinson's. So these are not one-to-one -one correlations or predictions, but it shows you how powerful the influences are beyond the gene itself. So we have this, something's just not right. 
Our air is clean, our water is pure, we all get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. <laughs> so Paleolithic aging was 25 to 30 years. Look where we are now. And that is the, due to the modification of the basic genetic expression for the human species. Um, how is this achieved? How, is this, how does this happen? The interface between intracellular and extracellular influences on the gene occurs through something called single nucleotide polymorphisms, which like everything in epigenetics is ungodly long, all called SNPs. It's like a molecular sheath around the gene itself that acts like a rheostat. It can be turned up or turned down, and the expression of that particular characteristic that that gene is designed to express will either increase or decrease depending on the interaction between the SNP and the environment of the gene itself intracellularly by or external influences. I'm going to look at a number of things that to me are really quite amazing. I think we fail to realize the impact of the graying of planet Earth, that we are in fact an aging population. Uh, life expectancy by birth, we have 81 years for men, 74 years for women. That is not, although I do believe women are biologically superior, I really do, um, for many reasons. But this is not due to the fact that there's anything inherently better about if we will, feminine genes. It's that if you look at this statistic, men do a better job of killing themselves, more suicides, more fatal automobile accidents, more high risk uh, uh, deaths during sports, more automobile accidents, more homicides, et cetera. So the, the bottom line is that men do a better job of killing ourselves than women. So there's no reason why this differential has to exist. Now, this is a global look if you look at 1950 over to the year 2030, what you see in the middle, the blue and yellow, are the developed nations. So you see it's basically relatively unchanged in terms of the aging of the population. When you look on the left and the right, the green and the kind of pink color, those are the developing worlds. And what we find is that the biggest explosion of population aging on the planet is happening in third world nations. And we're going to see that continuing into 2030 uh, and beyond. The percentage of increase in elderly are greater than 65. You see the United States is probably six. But look at Colombia, Indonesia, Kenya, Thailand, all of these third, quote, third world nations where we're having this explosion of longevity. That's not genes at work. That's the expression that is governing those genetic expressions that are taking place globally. And it's invisible to us. We really have not paid attention to this. Um, so it's kind of something like this, kind of progress and <laughs> get the last frame. Uh, well, that sucked. Um, all of our research and our, our UCSF uh, research program is geared to that continuum, excluding the, well, that sucked. We'd like to get a hooray at the end of it. Uh, so this is looking at the population 85 and older, and what we find by the year 2050, there'll be 5% of the population will be 85 or older. That's a huge number of individuals, which we will see. Um, and look at the two-tenths of a percent from 1900, and by 2050, we're up to nearly 5%. That's an enormous increase. Uh, actual and projected changes, if we look at the different impacts, uh, public health, nutritional medicine, antibiotics, vaccines, lifestyle changes have had, we get to the 2000s where we've projected roughly 120. Now, word of caution, the 120 is based on something called the Hayflick limit. A Berkeley biologist in the 1970s, Leonard Hayflick, uh, asked the question, if you allowed human cells to replicate under optimal circumstances, how long would that predict the human life expectancy? And he allowed them to regenerate under optimal conditions and predicted it would be 120. And that's been called the Hayflick limit. We all genuflect to that and believe that's the absolute limit of human life expectancy. It is not. It is absolutely unequivocally not. This is looking at the population of centenarians. There'll be nearly a billion 
centenarians in the United States by the year 2050. That's a lot of people living to 100, again, usually in optimal health. This is my favorite person of all time. Her name is Jean Calumet. Is the oldest documented person on the planet. Lived to 100, more than 123. That is 123 in six months. Uh, she died about three years ago. She's lived in Paris. Um, and this is the kicker. <laughs> right. Now, when she was, I think, 100, a kid, like of 119 or 120, she was interviewed and said, um, to what you owe your, your long life expectancy. And she said, fine brandy, young men, and galois, <laughs> those disgusting little French cigarettes that are like cigars. Um, and the, this is a, an important factor because you will see in the long-lived cultures, which we'll get to at the end, they do smoke. But it is not to reared tobacco with petrochemicals. It's not refined. It's not packaged with filters that add petrochemical exposures to them. This is homegrown, rolled. They don't inhale. They puff like a, like a cigar or a, a pipe. So it's smoky, but not smoky. And I raised that because uh, when I first reported this, a cig the cigarette companies loved it. They had these headlines about smoking and longevity are, are fine. <laughs> not true. Um, our project at UCSF, in a nutshell, I'm not going to go into detail, but what we're doing is we're using a construction as an, an analogy. So we're looking at the uh, basic genetic blueprint of a population of individuals, which is like the house plan. So you have a blueprint of a house. Secondly, then you have the blood, and it's what happens when the genetic predisposition begins to show up in the blood chemistry and influences the organs and the organ as a organism as a whole. Lastly, with the microbiome, how do you know what's taken place? When all is said and done, the excretion from the microbiome tells us how is that all gone. Now, there are some, there are some incredibly complex relationships between these three levels. Some map directly, others don't. Some show up in the gene, not in the blood. Some are in the blood, but you don't know where it is in the gene. So this is something that we're trying to map out, and we're working with pharmaceuticals to lifestyle changes, which we'll see, to understand and map this pathway. So we really understand where are we going? Where are we headed? And that's the reason we're looking at these long-lived populations. I'm, I'm a lifelong open ocean sailor. And the one thing you know if you're, open, if you're sailing in the open ocean, which is the only difference between ending up in Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is one degree. So if you get your course correction when you leave the harbor is one degree accurate, you will end up where you want to be. If not, there are 359 wrong directions. So some of this is just to give us a sense of what, what's our direction, where are we going? Um, now, this, when I mentioned earlier how what a complex area this is, when cartographers used to map the ancient world, they always around the edge had a phrase, here dwell dragons, <laughs> meaning the vast unknown beyond the continents that were being mapped. These are simply a few characteristics of the things that we're sorting out that you've been hearing about yesterday, you'll hear more about today. But in senolytic pharmacology, we're looking at metformin, rampamycin, NAD, uh, uh, omega-3s, taurine, curcumin, the microbiome, pre- and postbiotics, uh, biotelemetry. These are all of the uh, pharmacological, uh, technological, if you will, interventions to extend life expectancy, all of which are being applied, all of which are being evaluated, multiple laboratories, and again, the polyphenol study we just saw from Dr. Perlmutter, I think, is a great example of that. Biohacking, um, all of the things that we think are, in fact, things that will extend human life expectancy, for which there's good evidence. So we have intermittent fasting, we have the Hayflick limit, we have stem cell banking, uh, we have clotho, which is pla uh, platelet factor PF4, um, anti-aging hormone injections, Alzheimer's slowing and reversing, Dr. Bredesen's uh, pioneering work that I, I, I think is absolutely phenomenal. Um, we have medical grade hyperbaric oxygen at clinics in uh, Israel, uh, cryonic freezing, cold water immersion, Wim Hof, who's been the person that's been a test case, if you will, of his own uh, deep water immersion. 
Uh, we have epigenetic assays. We've just looked and seen with the grim age assay that was used in the probiotic study, but there are many different clocks. How do we know how old we are? We don't. And clocks give different predictions of age and there are different correlations as you saw. Um, so these, and we see, you know, we have the, the telomeres, uh, which is Elizabeth Blackburn who heads up our program at UCSF and I'll see a little bit of detail uh, about that. But this is a vast array of research going on globally that will in fact begin to knit together. That's for the basis of my prediction. Within the next five to 10 years, we're going to see fruits of this bear out, have a direct practical impact on human longevity. Um, so this is our, uh, keeps us uh, sane when at UCSF. This, I'm, I got one of those DNA kits, turns out I'm 85% water, 18% dirt, and 7% dog pee. So, Favorite cartoons, yeah, I told you. It keeps you awake, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so this is Elizabeth Blackburn on the left. She heads our program. She, she uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for her discovery of the uh, telomeres. What is a telomere? It's an X-shaped chromosome. This is an electron microscopy for a telomere. It has two dimensions. One is the length of the arm that predicts longevity, literally longevity. The longer the arm, the more long-lived the organism, the more, more long-lived the person. The second is the tip you see in green. It's not really green, but in the, this enhanced, um, is the integrity of the tip. So when you have individuals who are long-lived, you have a long arm and an intact uh, tip on the uh, telomere. And we see on the left that without telomerase, we, we've used telomerase injections, um, that the tip begins to fray, the cells don't replicate accurately, and you get what we call on the global scale, aging. On the right-hand side, you see with telomerase, we have accurate replication of cells, and we extend the life expectancy of those cells beyond the Hayflick limit in a laboratory. Um, between telomeres and aging, in any living organism, uh, aging is the result of decrease in the number and structure and function of cells. And the last point, telomere length is a crucial biomarker providing insight into understanding optimal aging. Uh, decrease in telomere activity precedes telomere shortening. At cellular level, senescence, chromosomal instability uh, affect the ends of the eukaryotic chromosome. So these are all of the influences that impact uh, in a negative way on the chromosome. And finally, the shortening of the telomere has been shown to be associated with increased mortality. So the question for us and our focus in the lab is how do you prevent that from occurring? And it's not that the telomere drives aging, but it's a biomarker. It tells us about all of the other influences accurately are, are impacting the subjects in our study. Um, I think all of us are familiar <clears throat> with these photographs. Um, Barack Obama, Abraham Lincoln, Bill Clinton, George Bush. The impact of aging in eight years is so evident. This is not due to bad diet or lack of social support or, or any of the other things we associate with aging. This is sheer stress of the burden of office. Um, we did a study uh, that uh, we did with uh, Dr. Alyssa Eppel and Dr. Blackburn that lifestyle indicates that a lifestyle can in fact lengthen telomeres in 12 weeks. This involved a dietary intervention, exercise, stress management, and the group itself provided social support. And it, we did, in fact, measure pre and post, and the telomeres, in fact, lengthened and became more uh, integrated, more intact. Um, this is, I'm not going to too much detail here, uh, but this is that lifestyle choices like these in that study do in, it offset dementia risk. And again, I'm not gonna belabor this because we have the expert in terms of reducing Alzheimer's uh, risk with uh, Dr. Bredesen. It says, you don't look anything like the long-haired skinny kid I married 25 years ago. I need a DNA sample to make sure it's still you. <laughs> okay. DNA does not change. The myth that we're modifying DNA does, is, is just that. What we're modifying is the expression of DNA. DNA can be damaged by petrochemical exposures like glyphosate, radiation, 
um, oxygen deprivation, extreme temperature. So the DNA can be damaged and therefore replicate in error. But if left to its own under optimal sync conditions, which is what we're looking at now, it in fact is the same. You will be the same person despite the changes. Um, this is uh, one of the factors in many, many studies, and we've, seen, we've heard a few of them over the last few days, looking at what are the influences. One is physical activity. Um, and the bottom line of this particular study, as there are in many others, is that long-term endurance exercise provides a protective effect on telomere length in older people. So use it or lose it is critical. Um, it is, it is a, a fact now. It's not a matter of, gee, it feels good or look good. We can document the fact that this has a direct effect on the telomere. So it's this. I don't care if your friend has a flight simulator. You're going to learn to fly on your own. <laughs> That's what we need to tell our kids who are glued to the <laughs> computer screens. Um, these are just simply um, things, again, that we've heard. But to reiterate, on a human level, what we have found is that how you, what shortens, what, what in fact, in, uh, increases the integrity of the telomere. Um, meditation, the healthy diet that we've heard described, largely Mediterranean, pescatarian, exercise, and happiness, laughter. One of the things that's an absolute certainty, as soon as you laugh, if you found any of these cartoons to be interesting, that shifts from cardiometabolic negative to anaerobic uh, and, and anabolic uh, development. Um, so it, it's an instantaneous shift in the brain. It takes a thousandth of a second to go from a stressed out body to one that's totally regenerative sheer humor, and you'll find with these long-lived populations, the presence of their sense of humor is really remarkable. The obvious things that shorten it are obesity, stress, radiation, smoking, pollution, lifestyle diseases, oxidative stress, et cetera, the, the usual dire litany. So adopting healthy multiple lifestyles is protect, protective. There are things you can do to protect your brain and reduce the risk of cognitive decline as you age. That's a fact. Um, again, this is a little, um, I'm going to skip this. Um, can't, can't skip this one. Be careful about reading books about health. You might die of a misprint. Uh, so all of these competing recommendations, and I, I, I bring that up because when you look on the internet, I mean, I get daily barrage of this supplement, this activity, this cold water immersion, this infrared therapy is going to guarantee you an extreme life expectancy. No, it won't. <laughs> There's no magic bullet, I think, as we're seeing uh, in all of the presentations. This is a complex mix. We're beginning to sort it out. We'll begin to put the pieces together. And we will find interventions. And the interventions will not be necessarily built on the biotechnology that we're fixated on. That's an important point, And that's the final thing that I want to get to. Um, we do, in fact, use telomerase in our, our research. It's a uh, pharmaceutical that is known to actually regress, re to um, basically reinstate uh, youth in, uh, in uh, laboratory animals. Um, the brain, spleen, and reproductive organs are all rejuvenated. The resulting increase in neurons and viable sperm count. There's a sense of smell that returned, which is really critical, by the way, as, a, as evidence of microglial uh, activity in the brain. And none of the mice developed cancer, which I think is kind of fascinating. This is an injection of telomerase and largely being looked at now at Harvard, David Sinclair's lab, where he's developed a cocktail that will accelerate aging and reverse aging. That was a study that was just published three months ago that you could accelerate laboratory animal aging, and then you could reverse it in a matter of a very short period of time. And this little cocktail, if you will, is something that I think will, will yield results for us. So this is, I demand a DNA test. You, know, you really need to know, is this accurate, what we're perceiving? Um, so TREM2 is, uh, TREM is a genetic biomarker that uh, it's, it helps the microglial sh cells uh, uh, purge itself of uh, byproducts. So when a person is under stress, poor diet, lack of nutrition, lack of exercise, uh, you'll get a, an aggregation of byproducts 
in the brain. We call it by many names, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive impairment, but TREM2 is a variable that seems to purge the microglial um, uh, uh, pathways. So UB Blake had it right. If I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. Um, that's when he was 96 years old. I think he lived to be 98 or 99, but quite a character. Um, now, this is looking at meditation and epigenetics, moving away from something that is more biochemical and, and well, I guess that, that slide was blank. Um, visualize this. That slide should have said <laughs> that there's a study, two studies at Harvard, uh, looked at a group of 20, 20 uh, meditators over a period of 12 weeks with an extensive array of epigenetic biomarkers. I think there are 20 biomarkers. And all of the biomarkers in 12 weeks of a basic mindfulness meditation moved in a positive regenerative direction. All moved in a positive direction. No other changes, just the practice of meditation. So some, the second study, which was on that slide, um, was some smart Harvard graduate student, there's always one, um, said, gee, if it takes 12 weeks, what's the shortest amount of time it could take? So he took a group of individuals and had them did a, a, an epigenetic assay before and after 20 minutes, a 20 minutes of meditation found all of the biomarkers shifted in a positive regenerative direction after 20 minutes of meditation. Now that doesn't mean 20 minutes of meditation is gonna solve all our problems, but it does show you how delicate this balance and how it can be shifted practically one way or the other. This is the Dalai Lama's birthday. Wow, nothing, just what I wanted. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> okay, uh, it's not changing. Help. <laughs> this must be the nothingness section. Aha, okay. Now, this one is also blank. I apologize. Um, this is an illustration of how delicate the balance is in the shift in epigenetic biomarkers. So NASA, to much to my surprise, is the largest repository of studies on the epigenetic endowment of twins and the impact on aging and health. Now you might think, why does NASA care? And I asked the medical director, who's a friend, um, why do they care about this? And what he pointed out was this particular study illustrates, which is when Scott Kelly returned from one year duration in space, his brother, who's an identical twin, who's also an astronaut, was on Earth. So they had completely mapped uh, panels, biomarkers for them. What they found is that 7% 7%, hold that in mind, of Scott Kelly's biomarkers had shifted in a negative direction. Impaired uh, glycogen restore, uh, impaired uh, cellular replication. Now that may sound, like, I don't know if that sounds like a little or a lot, but consider the baseline, which is for us, human beings, to differentiate from chimpanzees, 1%. 1% differentiates our genetic code from that of a chimpanzee. So 7% is huge. Now they've done follow-up studies with him and with other astronauts, and what they found is that, I think in his case, the 7%, 3% or 4% had regressed to the mean, they returned to normal. However, 3% at least, or 4%, did not return to baseline. So the concern for NASA is what happens on long duration space flight. If it happens in a year and 4% of our epigenetic markers change in expression in a year, what happens with long duration space flight? What happens when we try to colonize other planets and are living in a very different kind of environment? These are very practical reasons. We can solve the rocketry, the telemetry, but not perhaps the human biological limits. So this shows you how it can shift one year and a major shift that is an ir seemingly irreversible. We don't know what it means. We don't know what it means. Did he become susceptible to some strange disease? Did he become immune to every form of cancer? Will he be cancer free for the rest of his life? We have no idea what those uh, changes in the biomarkers mean. So. Punchline, I promised you this, 
this is the divine dozen. So when all is said and done, for me, the interesting thing in looking at practical human longevity and the neuroendocrinology of how, of where we're going, what does it look like? What does the end of the road look like? Uh, we've dubbed this the divine dozen. It's the 12 factors that if you look at living, breathing in the world right now, today, examples of extreme longevity, does it exist? The answer is yes. <laughs> or is there anything extraordinary about it? The answer to that is no. <laughs> These are all attainable characteristics that seem to be responsible for creating the phenomena we know as extended human lifespan, extended longevity to 120 in most cases, and I believe with the breakthroughs we're talking about, we can extend that to as much as 150. So one is they all have a Mediterranean diet variant, if you will. Um, they do have fish, they are pescatarian, but they have little or no red meat or poultry. Now that's not because they did read an article about red meat being bad for you, because it's not, by the way. Um, but it's expensive <laughs> to raise cattle, sheep, uh, poultry for slaughter is a very expensive, non-productive use of, of time. Smoking, they do smoke, it's non-processed, it's the little cigarettes that are smoked and puffed, um, but no, uh, biochemicals used in rearing the tobacco, in processing it into a smoking meal. Physical activity, we mentioned that we see that physical activity is a major driver. They do not have gymnasiums. <laughs> None of them have physical personal trainers. They're farmers. They bend, they lift, they move, they walk. They maintain their life expectancies. And one of the recommendations yesterday, I think it was about farming. I forgot who made that. It was a great, great recommendation. Um, but that's the reality of their life. Um, they have strong psychosocial bonds. No person is an island. Um, they have, uh, you know, uh, domestic uh, and farm animals. So horses, dogs, cats, hogs, um, are part of their life. And we know that people who have animals have a longer life expectancy um, than people who don't. They're, the depression and loneliness scales that are applied to people with and without animals are all better for people that have uh, domestic animals. Old age is respected. I think this is critical. Someone might say, well, why live to be 120 if I'm gonna be you know, relegated to the scrap heap? This is not the case at all, and these, I can't emphasize this enough. The elders govern. <laughs> they govern everything that happens. They govern marriages, they govern economics, they settle family disputes, they have to do with transi trans, uh, transition of properties. What, this is a little bit of an aside, but years ago we did an, a smoking intervention, a telemedicine-based smoking intervention with the Bank of America. That's my particular niche of study. Uh, but it worked really, really well. We had an invitation from Warsaw, from Poland, to go and replicate the study with a company based in Warsaw. We went, program totally failed. I mean, we got no participation. And in despair, we were talking with our Polish colleagues and we said, what? We, we know it works. I mean, we've got published data. You know, look at the evidence. And they said, well, have you talked to the grandmothers? We said, what? The grandmothers. They said, well, if you haven't talked to the grandmothers, you've missed it. Because unless they say smoking cessation is good for you or your family, it won't happen. So we got the grandmothers involved in the study, ran the same thing, it worked perfectly. So this is the, the influence, if you will, of the respect they have for long age. They're sexually active. When you're there, it's, and I mean, it tells you how tactily uh, defensive we are. They, they kind of touch and hug and kiss and everything's a celebration. Your arrival is a celebration, your leaving is a celebration, going to bed at night is a celebration, glad to see you in the morning. So there's always physical touching. And they do, they are sexual into their 80s and 90s. Um, yeah, it's interesting to be propositioned by a woman in her 90s, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, this is Mae West. I generally avoid temptation unless I can't resist it. 
I think that would be a good slogan for these individuals with regard to their uh, sexuality and physicality. There are other May West quotes that I can't use. Um, now, they have no fear of death. They do not live to be 110, 115 because they want to live to be 110 or 115. That's not their goal. Their goal is a life fully and well expressed. And they don't have a fear of death. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. James Fries at Stanford called Squaring the Curve wrote a, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that when you have health span, what tends to happen is you have a long, flat life expectancy, and then within two or three days, there's a rapid drop off and death. So you don't have periods of long, lingering disability, morbidity and mortality. That does not exist in these cultures. In fact, they will say, and they, there are stories, and we've seen it happen, they'll say, let's celebrate this weekend, I won't be with you on Monday. Sure enough, they die in their sleep on you know, Sunday night. But they have a sense of when they know the end of their life is coming and they die within two or three days, usually peacefully and usually without uh, remorse. Alcohol consumption, much more than what we would consume moderate. We have all these guidelines about moderate alcohol consumption and the dreaded one drink a day was gonna kill all of us. It, it's just nonsense. But you have to look at the pattern of consumption. They drink wine and beer, by and large, not highly refined alcohol, but they have it at breakfast, at lunch, in the middle of the afternoon, in the evening, before going to sleep. So it's consumed throughout the day. It's consumed with food and it's consumed in company. So it's not isolated, depressed uh, alcohol consumption they have appropriate medical care. That's always overlooked in studying these communities. They do have good primary care medicine. What they don't have is an MRI for a tennis elbow. <laughs> you know, there are more MRI, take this example in San Francisco, there are more MRIs in San Francisco than in all of Canada. That makes no sense, except for the fact that it drives revenue, drives procedures and protocols completely unnecessary screening with MRIs. So they, they have very, very good primary care. Usually, in, not usually, always incorporates the local indigenous medicine. So herbals, meditations, uh, various kinds of concoctions, if they will, like chiropractic or other kinds of strategies that actually are incorporated into the primary care medical system. In, when I've worked in Singapore, um, IBM Singapore has Ayurveda completely incorporated into the IBM, me IBM medical plan. And, I, and again, when I was there, I first got there, I said, well, that's very odd. They said, well, no. So many of our employees come from India. If we didn't include Ayurveda as part of our general medical plan, we're not meeting their needs. So it depend again, it's this locally adaptive uh, primary medical care system. Clearly, there are genetic influences that have accumulated over time. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but again, when we see all the factors that we've been looking at for this last period of time, we know that it's not the genes, it's the expression. Finally, they all have uh, periods of quiet, of meditation, of introspection. There's always a sense of purpose in life and a purpose in their life. Uh, you don't find people being depressed, feeling abandoned, afloat, in disarray, and you, ha and you do not see, you do not see Alzheimer's. These are intact, cognitively focused, all of their senses, their mathematical ability, cognitive recall, short-term memory, long-term memory are intact up until Usually their average life expectancy ranges in this culture is somewhere between 110 and 115. Um, but we've also seen with John Calumet at 123, she's already proven kind of the white crow phenomena, which is one person who broke the hate limit that is documented, proves the case that it's not an absolute upper limit. And I do not believe that it is. So this is, I guess, an admonition. Uh, health nuts are going to feel stupid some died laying in the hospital dying of nothing um, that's true uh, they all all our lives will in fact come to an end but the way in which these individuals treat uh, the end of life with great dignity normally uh, i've been at the death of several of them it's very quiet it's very dignified you almost don't know they've left and uh, it, it's really very uh, very powerful um, 
let's see, I think this is just a quick summary. Tripartite assay is what we're working on. Genes predict probabilities, not certainties. Uh, the biomarkers of health, not disease. I've always been more interested in health, as you can tell. I've been more interested in longevity than I am in the things that shorten our lives. When Jeff and I met in the, in the mid-70s, I had just finished a series of studies on adept meditators. Uh, the, the NIH grant was for pain, but I didn't care about pain. That was not of interest to me. What I wanted to know is how do the adept meditators control bleeding, pain, and infection? and was the first documentation that this was real, that kind of uh, autonomic regulation by individuals through practice of meditation was one of the first documented cases of that. It took a year of peer review to get it published because they didn't believe the data. We had to submit all our data tapes. Um, so the point is, is that this has been, hopefully to you, a presentation about health, the best that we can expect, and looking into an optimistic future. Um, Monogenic or fully penetrated genes are rare. They count to less than five to eight percent of what we see as adult disease is fully penetrant or monogenic in, in nature. The rest has to do with lifestyle and all of the epigenetic influences. Uh, genes are turned on and off like a rheostat. The majority of gene expression is what we do matters. The majority of genetic expression is governed by beliefs and lifestyle choices. And finally, Neanderthal genes are alive and well. All of us in this room have somewhere between 5 and 7% of our genetic inheritance is Neanderthal. Neanderthal. Um, for some, cop some populations on the planet, it's even more than that. And this is not to denigrate the, you know, the, the stereotype of the um, ape-like Neanderthal. It's not a denigration. It's that our survival fight-flight response can normally be attributed to the qualities that we saw in the Neanderthal. Uh, genetic population. If you need more or want anything more, uh, here's my latest book uh, with an introduction by Andy Wilde, who's my, also my very longtime friend for about 50 years from Harvard, and, uh, and on my website, uh, drpelletier.com. And that's it. <laughs>